name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jane Austen's Juvenalia and the movie Becoming Jane. I don't often bring in film, but today we're going to. So Jane Austen wrote three notebooks worth of short stories, plays, and poetry as a young girl and in her teen years, which very early show how bright her intelligence was, her wit, her talent, but also her very keen understanding of the novel, its structure, and its purpose. These three notebooks were a gift from a doting father and a family that clearly encouraged and appreciated her talent. And while she dabbled in verse in a few humorous plays, presumably for her family to put on themselves, it's clear that from the beginning her focus was on novel writing. Now, I came by this volume because I was actually required to uh, have it as a text for a college class that I took on Jane Austen. We read a few selections from it, but I never read the whole thing until now, and I am so glad I did. The early writing is definitely choppy and unrefined, but oh, oh my heavens, does she have a spicy little wit. It, her sense of humor is just like, it's, I, I mean, there are moments where I'm literally guffawing and chortling as I'm like reading this out loud. Like some of her jokes are just outrageous. And you can really see the writer that she was to become. And while her major novels are among some of the most famous classics in English literature is because they are brilliant, I couldn't help but feel that in that refinement process, yes, a profound amount was gained. But there was also something kind of lost in the process as well. And it's really this sort of wicked wit that she has. It really has to be toned down by the time we get her in a sort of publishable form. I can just imagine her being quite aware of the fact that like she could not say <laughs> this and expect a manuscript to be picked up by a publisher. And while her sort of sense of humor gets constrained to perhaps a little wink from the narrator, which is still really fun when you read some of her major novels, you feel like you're on the, you know, I don't know, like Jane Austen is the cool girl in class and you're in on the inside joke and she's chosen to be friends with you. You have this sense of intimacy with the narrator who is really smart and brilliant and fun and who's very tongue in cheek, who says these, you know, hilarious things, but sort of under her breath, right? So it's more secretive, perhaps, and definitely under undercover, if you will, by the time we get to our novels. But by containing that humor, I think there was a lot more room for maybe character development and uh, psychology, this sort of fine development of psychology in her characters to sort of come through, as well as, like, really the, the refinement of plot as well. So there's something gained, something, something lost in that refining process. It also seems that most of the criticism of her juvenilia from sort of like the generations immediately after her, because this was sort of like eventually published posthumously and sort of maintained by the family estate. And it seems like maybe some of the family members were maybe a little bit embarrassed by this, probably because of these outrageous jokes that she makes. But they also maybe thought that it was not as good as her other stuff which in some ways it's, it's not, but in some ways it's like really, really brilliant. I feel like it's underappreciated. And I think, you know, even into our more recent past, it's still kind of in this view that these are sort of like trifling experiments from a not yet formed author, you know, and it, it really diminishes what is, what is in them. And I, and I just don't see them that way. Already we have sketches of characters who would become Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Um, we have our wonderful prose and sentence structure, which just sets you up for these zinger punchlines. And you can see that structure even, I was just reading, finishing up Pride and Prejudice, and it was like, I was like, oh, I'm so glad that I read this first because it was like, I could just see, there's just such a direct line between these things. And so to pretend like this is sort of like a non-entity, but then these are sort of great novels, like you're missing sort of that middle thing. And this is that middle thing. It is not trifling and it's not insignificant. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Love and Friendship really reads as a satire of Pamela and similar novels. Uh, and by the time you get to the point where she's composing Catherine, which is the major work included here, and it's the longest piece, I mean, it feels like already reading a Jane Austen novel. So even though you come from these sort of like short stories and snippets that are not really fully fleshed out, by the time you get to the end of the third volume, you really do have Jane Austen as we understand her. And then again, in these short stories, I think she just proves over and over again her 
highly developed sense of the novel and sense of literature at the time. She must have been extraordinarily well read. So one thing that I noticed when I read this was how much of the juvenilia was used in the 1999 film version of Mansfield Park. And the way they used it just seemed strange to me. Like I just don't quite, I wish, I wish I could just ask the screenwriters and like the director why they, tell me why you made this choice. Do not understand. Um, so in the film, they sort of reimagined Fanny as the author of Jane's History of England, which is hilarious. In the end, Edmund sort of names her writings the same title that Jane's father actually gave her volumes, which is a fusions of fancy and in a style entirely new. And then finally, there's this one quote that Fanny says slash writes to her younger sister, which is, run as often as you choose, but do not faint. But she... <laughs> But it's like done, okay, so it's always done in like this super serious tone. Run as often as you choose, but do not faint. You know, it's like super, I don't know why they, like, I don't, even when I watched it, I was like, I don't understand what this line is trying to tell me. Like, what is going on here? And then I read it, it the line appears in Love and Friendship, which is this absurdly satirical story, right? And so in the context of the story where this line comes up, it's like these two histrionic characters who are women, they, even on their first meeting of each other, when they're unburdening their bosoms to each other in friendship, they have like synchronized fainting fits. So again, it's just like absolutely absurdist humor, right? And then the narrator and her best friend, because it's done in this epistolary style, so the main character is writing this letter and she's telling the story about how both of their husbands have died. And so one has a fainting fit and the other one sort of like flies into this frenzy and apparently is like screaming at the sky and like all night long and it's just marching around in the night. Um, and the one who faints on the cold, damp night catches a cold and eventually dies. And that's where the line comes in where she's basically like, don't get into fainting fits because you'll die. But if you want to get into a frenzy, that's totally fine. It appears that getting into a frenzy is like really good for your health and constitution. So it's this really absurdist type of humor that in the way that it's used here, but it's like super, super serious in Mansfield Park. And it just doesn't make sense. Someone explain it to me. Someone who knows more about this than I do. Explain to moi. Thank you. But switching gears from Mansfield, I now want to talk about Becoming Jane, which I teased in our intro. Because again, I think Becoming Jane kind of works within this same conception of Jane Austen's juvenilia being immature, childish, insignificant works. <laughs> as a movie and as a period and as a romance piece, I think it's a perfectly enjoyable film. And it has some actors that I really enjoy. But as an imagining of Jane Austen, I find it a bit insulting. I don't like to say negative things about things, uh, but this is how I feel. So again, like I said, I think the movie makes the same mistake that the early critics did, supposing that Jane Austen's juvenilia was childish and unsophisticated. And while the romance narrative is fun, and it seems to be a smash up of two men who actually were in Jane Austen's life, one is Tom Lafroy, which seems to be a young man that she really did fall in love with, and the other is a man named Harris Bigwither, Yes, that's his real name, Harris Figwither. And he was the one who proposed to Jane and she accepted him, but the next day, like, changed her mind. So the one sort of real engagement that she had lasted, like, less than one day. But, so they kind of, like, mash up these two figures, it seems. But I also found this sort of, like, male romance thing, kind of, its place in the narrative was also insulting. So, and, and now maybe I'm interpreting. <laughs> I'm totally interpreting it correctly. Uh, but it seems to me that the movie makes this sort of like love interest uh, the defining life experience for Jane to form her into the phenomenal author that she would become. So the fact that we have this Tom Lafroy character introducing her to Henry Fielding as though she never read him before, that's just laughable. That's, I just like know that didn't happen. You can see her already in her works that she's writing when she's 12, 13 years old, using this structure and is clearly familiar with the literary landscape of the time. Let alone that the opening line of Pride and Prejudice is a clear nod to, um, is it Tom Jones? I 
think it's Tom Jones. So there's that. That the other thing that I really like don't like about it is it sort of implies that she needs this like sexual awakening to become like a true artist. That like seeing him boxing shirtless, doing fisticuffs with his pasty skin and heavy breathing, you know, <laughs> I'm hyperventilating. So now I can be an author. And then also this idea that he's like reading these naturalist articles of like the natural flight of beetles. Oh, the panting yet again. Like that that's what formed her into the fine artist and craftsman that she was become that she was to become is like <laughs> I just don't like it and I just don't think it's true. I just think there's like no foundation for it. And I think this type of narrative is one that we see a lot. <laughs> Should we have a female lead? A good chunk of the narrative is focusing on her formation, and her formation inevitably comes from a love interest, a male love interest, as though she could not be self- she doesn't actually become a human being until she falls in love. I want to give you- I want to propose something that might be controversial, that even when women don't have a like, love story in their lives, they're still people with ambitions and talent and capabilities. I'm gonna throw that out there. And so I think that while it sort of like purports to be this feminist exploration of this wonderful author, it ends up being sort of like undercut by this sort of anti-feminist structure in which Jane would not be Jane if Tom with his Tomness did not come into her life. And the same structure underlies Wonder Woman. She doesn't become self actualized as a heroine until she gets heartbroken by apparently a British pilot, although I don't... Did he not have time for it to learn an accent? I don't know. And, the, and I think even we have the same structure in the movie Hidden Figures as well, even though it's not a romantic lead, we have this sort of paternalistic figure and character who's completely made up and didn't exist, by the way, to sort of stand in the gap for these women. And it's like, it's just completely unnecessary because it's just not... And apparently, in both of these cases, historically inaccurate. So there's that, too. So, now you know what I think of Wonder Woman. I thought it sucked big ones, but that's all I have for you today. In the meantime, I highly suggest you pick up and start reading some of Jane Austen's Juvenalia. It's just such a great way to see the through line and the thread of the author that she would become, especially when you sort of see it like here with Northanger Abbey, because I think this is sort of like one of her least refined novels. And so you can see sort of like how she goes from like, like this gradation of Right, like if I put it in a gradient of novels, <laughs> of novel development. Okay, stop being weird. But anyway, it's well worth reading. Also, you'll laugh out loud. It's laugh out loud funny. And I don't know, it just puts a, a new perspective on Jay. And, and I think it's also worth reading if you're interested in the development of an artist. That's the other thing that I think is really fascinating here. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.